do that. So I do want to welcome everyone to the, um, I guess this is the last session uh, for the wildlife program. I uh, hope everyone has uh, enjoyed the other other ones that you, if you've been able to attend those. And this has been a collaborative e effort uh, from other agents uh, uh, from Franklin County, from Vance County, Warren County, and Person and Granville County. So um, do want to thank all the the agents that have been involved with this and uh, all the presenters as well. But if um, if any if the other agents that are here want to just wave or say hey real quick and then we'll get get started. Um, they've been Paul Westfall as director in Granville County. Yep. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, <laughs> Charles Mitchell, who is the county director in Franklin County. I'm a little distorted, but <laughs> we, see we see you. We see you. Paul McKenzie, who is the agriculture agent in Warren and Vance County. I don't know if he can join us or not. He's uh, I think he's mobile right now. So <laughs> um, Kim Woods, the livestock agent in Granville in Person County. Uh, Matthew Place, the uh, livestock agent in Warren County. And myself, Johnny Coley, the horticulture agent in Person in Granville County. I think I got everybody covered. We do have Gary Cross with us today, who's agriculture agent in Granville in Person County as well. So anyway, going to get started today. We're going to talk about uh, deer management, uh, how to maybe get some tips on how to how to control deers and, and crops and, and landscapes and uh, Mr. Greg Batts from the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission is going to speak to us today about that and uh, he's a wildlife biologist I guess aren't you Greg is that that is correct title all right and um, so without further ado I'm going to turn it over to, to Greg all right thanks Johnny Get over here and share my screen on this lovely technology we have these days. So, Johnny, can everybody see that? Not yet. Hold on, I, I turned it off. Stop sharing. There we go. Share screen. Now, can people see it? Yep, we're there. Okay. There we go. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm, I'm Greg Bass. I'm the district wildlife biologist. Um, I would cover um, Vance, Franklin, Warren counties, anything to the west in Granville, Person, Durham. All those counties are covered by another biologist in District 5, Jason Allen. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'll have both of our telephone numbers up here on the screen if you want to take those numbers down, if you got any questions for us about anything that we discuss or I discuss here. Um, Jason gets the same kind of questions so you'll know how to respond appropriately. And so we're going to talk about uh, managing deer damage. So one of the things that, that I want to um, want people to see here is that uh, our deer density, this is our most recent map. We just put this map out in 2020 in July, I think it was we did. Um, for Granville County, if you look at the 2010 map, uh, it didn't change. It's still 31 to 40 deer per square mile. Um, if you look over in Vance, it didn't change as well. It's still 41 to 50 deer per square mile. Uh, we think those are kind of, uh, you tend to look toward the lower side on those. So probably in Granville County, you're probably looking at around 30 deer per square mile and in Vance, uh, 40 deer per square mile. Now that's across the landscape. Um, and so some of you may be sitting there saying, I don't have any deer. Some of you may be saying, I have way more deer than that. So just consider that these, we, we basically, we pair these down to a county wide uh, level. So um, the point being here is, is that not have been a lot of change in these particular counties here. Uh, Warren County would be an exception if there's anybody watching from Warren County. We have had a pretty substantial decline in deer numbers over in Warren County. It's in the 21 to 30 deer per square mile now. Uh, Franklin County, is at 31 to 40. That's a little lower than it was um, 10 years ago. Um, our deer population basically peaked in North Carolina about 2013. Um, at that time, we were probably 
between 1.25 million and one and a half million deer in the state. Uh, now our estimate is back down somewhere between 900,000 and a million in the state. And what happened was, is in 2014, we had a severe outbreak of what's called epizootic hemorrhagic disease, which is a disease of deer. Um, and they get it from little biting midges, what you and I call no -sims. And so some of it's going on right now, as a matter of fact, we've had quite a bit of it in Wake County, uh, quite a bit in Surrey and Wilkes County over in the western part of the state. But uh, if the conditions are right with rainfall and stuff, these midges are out. They bite the deer, give the deer the virus, the deer live through the virus or they die, through the, die by the virus. Um, if they live through the virus and they have the antibodies to fight the virus off. And so um, in 2014, we had a new variant of this virus and it really took a toll on the deer herd. Franklin County was kind of the epicenter uh, of, the, of, the, of the problems that we had with EHD. It's a naturally occurring disease. Pets, humans can't get it. If you have cattle, cattle can get it, but this makes cattle mildly sick. It doesn't, it doesn't kill cattle. Um, so there's no human health concerns there. It's just a loss of deer. I say all this because if you, if you look to the eastern part of the state there, um, you'll see that a lot of those counties are now in 21 to 30 uh, or uh, 31 to 40. And those counties used to be way higher than that, greater than 40 deer per square mile. And so the whole eastern half of the state basically starting in, at, at about the edge of the Piedmont, uh, the deer numbers have, have went down pretty substantially. Uh, but they picked up over in the western part of the state. You see greater than 50 now in a lot of these counties in the, in the middle Piedmont and in the, in the western Piedmont and in the edge of the escarpment. Um, so the deer have picked up in numbers there. But uh, point being with all this is, is since 2014, a lot of our deer damage uh, calls and stuff and complaints have went down because quite simply the deer uh, population is lower. There are a lot of concerns amongst hunters and people that are in the outdoors that coyotes are a contributing factor to this as well. And so I would agree that coyotes have an impact on deer populations. Uh, in studies, you know, you, you can see pretty high uh, fawn mortality from, from predation when they're, when they're very young. And so coupled with the fact that we, the deer population got drove down pretty low from the natural mortality factor of uh, EHD, it's been slower for the deer population to come back in North Carolina. And this is not just a North Carolina issue. This is happening all over the southeastern United States. Um, the deer population has went down and then stabilized some. So that generally makes people that have problems with deer happy because you have less issues. That being said, those issues are generally alleviated in big, large farms where you have large acreages, soybeans, uh, you know, that, that type of situation. But it doesn't alleviate the problems that people have in urban areas. People in urban areas usually continue to have the problems um, because we provide all the best foods for them in an urban area and we pretty much protect them. The only thing you got to worry about if you're living in an urban area uh, generally is getting hit by a car. That, that's the biggest predator. You don't have so much hunting issues there. You don't have so much predation issues there. These, these deer will, some of you may know, these deer will live right up underneath uh, your bushes, right in your yard. Uh, and as long as you don't have a dog, they feel really safe there. And we commonly get calls about that. So we still see pretty large numbers in, in urban centers and you know in, in towns and stuff like that. Um, but in the rural areas, the, the deer population has uh, slid down a little bit in the last five, six years. So problems associated here, obviously, um, you'll see me use this term and people brutalize this term, it's depredation. We, we get called with all kinds of, of weird things, people asking for um, a depredation permit and they can't pronounce depredation, it's kind of funny to me, but uh, landscaping, um, gardens, obviously farm crops and then just natural natural habitats and generally that natural habitat thing would be revolved around like a, a state park or a federal park or something like that where you don't have any hunting or anything like that. You get this obvious, this picture in the bottom here, you get this obvious browse line where the deer pretty much have ate everything that they could reach. Uh, you'll see that if you've been up in the mountains like up used to be, not as bad anymore, 
but up in like Cades Cove and the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Some of the national battlefields uh, have this problem as well. And in some of the state, state parks as well have the same, same issue. And we've been working with some of the state parks to um, see what kind of numbers they have, where they could look at options for alleviating some of this problem. But you know, what I'm gonna concentrate here is gonna be farm crops, gardens, uh, landscaping type stuff. Uh, vehicle collisions, the most recent data, this is actually, the 15,950 was actually from 2018. I made a boo-boo there. Uh, and Wake County was the number one uh, place, as you might expect. Uh, but this is just reported um, to the police uh, collisions. And there, there's probably substantially more than that. I hit a deer last fall. I didn't report it to the police. And so there, there's probably a lot more than that. At one time in Wake County, um, the guy who has the contract for picking up roadkill deer in Wake County was picking up on the order of 3,000 deer in the county, uh, on county roads in, in Wake County. And they only harvest legal harvest somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,800 deer. So about twice as many deer were getting hit by cars than were being harvested uh, by folks in, in Wake County. Um, so obviously in these rural counties, you, you obviously have collisions, but probably not to the level that you would have collisions in some of these urban areas. But more common in the fall, um, it's due to changes in food sources right now. Uh, uh, people call me and they'll say, what's happened to my deer? Because they've been feeding them, they, you know, they're throwing corn out and stuff and they'll just leave. And, and so what's happening is right now you have acorns falling and in, it's in a deer's DNA to go for acorns and forget everything else. Um, Dr. Brown at uh, NC State was always fond of saying that, that uh, putting corn out was like uh, throwing out a, a, a cone of ice cream. It just, it just spoils you. Um, so they they will eat the corn, but it's carbohydrate, and uh, the acorns are fat. So they're going to go for that fat resource this time of the year because they need it to survive uh, through the winter. And then during the when they're pregnant, the females are pregnant during the uh, late winter and early spring. They need those fats. So uh, right now they're going to be going for acorns, and they will they will change where they go and uh, go for those acorns. Reproductive behavior. In this area, the average uh, conception date for deer is around about November the 8th. We know this because we have take, taken um, deer uh, and pulled the fetuses out. They grow at a known rate. And so we can backdate and tell exactly when that female was bred. And so we have really good data on that. And so we know that November the 8th is gonna be our, our uh, mean peak breeding. So you're going to have breeding that occurs after that, that occurs before that, but the majority of it is going on in that first week in November. Um, and so if you're driving around in your car, basically from about a week before Halloween to right after Thanksgiving, and you're driving after dark or early in the morning, that's when you're, you're most commonly going to hit a deer. And so just, just keep that in mind uh, coming up. And then of course, changes in daylight daylight hours and the way that people move and stuff about because of that change. Also, there's issues with diseases. Um, Lyme disease, we've had several cases of Lyme disease. Actually, our, our bear biologist in this state um, still currently is fighting Lyme disease, has been dealing with it now for about five years. Uh, and, and so Lyme disease is, is, is certainly a consideration uh, with deer and Obviously, any kind of other, there's other tick-borne diseases besides this, the Heartland virus, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, scarlet fever, all these things you can potentially get uh, from a deer, from the ticks that, that the deer carry with them. They will carry a high parasite load during the summer, and then um, in the fall, those parasites will go away, but obviously it can still be in their blood. And so anytime, if you're handling a deer or around a deer, it's always best to wear gloves and, and not get any any of that blood anywhere uh, where it could get inside of your system through a cut or through the eyes or nose or anything like that. Why do we have these problems? Um, urban sprawl, safety zones, these refuges, um, that, that's the kind of stuff that I was telling you about earlier. Uh, people protect them. Um, you'll get into some neighborhoods and somebody is really interested in having a really great garden 
and the person next door only wants to see 10 deer standing at their back door feeding them from their hand every day and so we run into these issues where um, you have homeowners associations and the homeowner association doesn't want them hunting deer or they want to hunt deer and it, it causes this whole little uproars in these communities about how to handle and deal with these issues uh, with deer uh, inside of these urban areas because some of these areas are safety zones so you might you might have a, uh, a subdivision that has a hundred homes in it and you know the the board might say oh well you can hunt 50% of them but 50% of them you can't and so guess what happens the deer go to the 50% that you can't and you can't get to them to hunt them um, so you have these refuges and things like that so if you're going to do it and you know recommend doing it inside of an, an urban situation or a situation like that in a, a neighborhood uh, by all means uh, go at it completely don't don't halfway do it um, that's probably not going to help you very much at all so if you're thinking about getting something like this going in a homeowner association or something like that get everybody on board or just don't do it at all it just causes too much bad blood amongst folks um, and in landscaping obviously um, these plants that that people plant that they love to see that have pretty flowers and on are just they're candy for the deer and so they're going to eat them and so nothing that nothing that i know of that looks very nice um is not palatable to deer you know if you, they want to eat cactus but people don't want to look at cactus right so um that's the kind of situation that we see is that um that that people want to plant pretty stuff and the pretty stuff is the stuff that's tasty to deer and in intentional feeding which i touched on before we see this all the time my neighbor, he's, he's feeding, you know, five gallons of corn and there's deer, there's 10, 12 deer out there every night. There's geese out there every night. There's turkeys coming up. Um, so we see this. It's not against the law in North Carolina to feed deer. Um, but I don't recommend it because what can happen is you can art artificially inflate the population in a given area. So once again, I'll use the example of using a uh, a homeowner association of you know a development um, so typically you might have you know the 30 deer per square mile that i was talking about there but if somebody's constantly feeding the deer and the deer in peak physical condition all the time that's max production for the number of fawns that they put out um, so then you have more and more and more deer uh, because you're artificially inflating the number of deer that could live in a given area they would outstrip their natural resources otherwise, but with people feeding them, they can continue just to go on, you know, just push up and push up with the population. So that's one of the problems with intentional feeding is that you can artificially inflate the population in an area. What actions can a landowner take? There's many tools in the toolbox. The best time to use the tools is before the problem ever starts, um, because we don't typically get the call until the problem starts. And, Here's what I hear from a lot of people. People first, when they have deer around, they're like, oh, wow, that's great. I got deer in my backyard. Then the deer start eating them out of house and home and they literally eat into their wallet because they plant plants, the deer eat them, they go back to Lowe's or Home Depot, buy more plants or the nursery, buy more plants. And the next thing you know, people get to the point where I want every one of these deer gone. They have cost me X number of dollars. I don't want to see another deer in this neighborhood. And that's that's typically what we see with people. So, um, it, you know, if you're going to do something that you know that's going to attract a deer, the best thing for you to do is to prepare for it ahead of time. So, using deer resistant plants, um, there, there's a lot of what I call xeric plants, so plants that would grow in dry areas out west. Um, that deer do not like to eat. Uh, what, what makes it, you know, succulent plants that grow in the southeastern United States, watery, uh, very luscious, and these xeric plants that are out west are very tough, very bitter. And so uh, all you got to do uh, online is just Google deer resistant plants that I can plant. Most of the uh, probably in NC State Ag Extension probably has a list of these plants that you can plant that deer um, tend not to like. Now, I say tend not to like because if your populations get really high because somebody's feeding the deer in a given area and, it, and they don't have anything else to eat, 
they will turn around and eat some of these things that people say that they don't like to eat. Um, and so, you know, nothing is a hundred percent deer proof, I guess is what my point is, but there are obviously things that they like to eat less and things that they like to eat more. Um, if you're growing, if you're trying to grow trees, if you're trying to have an orchard or something other like that, uh, putting up fencing around your trees and tree shelters around your trees is something that I would certainly recommend. Deer, particularly bucks, and especially this time of the year, search out aromatic trees. So trees like, um, you know, a lot of the fruit trees, uh, cedar, that type of stuff, they're going to search those trees out and they're going to rub them with their antlers. Um, it's part scent marking. Some of it is, has to do with just removing the velvet off of their antlers, but they can they can destroy your trees um, by doing that. Um, so putting up putting up tree shelters and fencing around your trees will go a long way in helping you uh, to keep from having that kind of damage to your trees. But just know that if you've got a tree um, that's aromatic, uh, that that a deer are going to want to rub it and. Uh, Fencing, um, there's a lot of different types of fencing here. These are just some examples here, an offset or double fence. You can see the photos there. And if you'll notice, and, and you'll hear uh, a lot of people say that a, that a deer can jump over an eight foot fence. And that's true, a deer can jump over an eight foot fence. But if you notice uh, what we're looking at here, this fence is only 43 inches tall in this top picture here. And most of the rest of these aren't either. The reason why this works is because deer do not have depth perception. They don't have the same depth perception that we have. So they walk up to this fence and even though they could easily jump this fence because it's only 43 inches tall, it looks insurmountable to them because they lack depth perception that we have. And so several of these low fence styles that you see work on the principle that deer do not have depth perception and they walk up and go, well, that's, that's, that's a mile across and I cannot jump that at all. And so that's the principle of how these offset double fences. And in the next slide, um, these, there's another, another slide past this with a 45 degree fence. But basically, um, a lot of these fences are also, they're electric and um, they do what we call the bait and electric switch. And so you put a, a piece of tin foil on there uh, with some peanut butter in it. And so uh, when you first put this fence out there and the deer walks up there, it's like, hmm, there's some peanut butter. Let me lick that. And then it gets zapped. And so they learn to stay clear of fences like that with, with this spacing and with electricity. So you don't have to have an eight foot fence, but you can have an, an, an electric fence if you design it and put it upright in small situations. Obviously, I understand this doesn't work for somebody who has 500 acres of soybeans. Um, but this will work if you, I, I see these kind of fences in Raleigh uh, around strawberry farms, where it's, you know, they, they have to protect their strawberry crop. I, I see these kind of fences, but these farms aren't very big. So that might be something that uh, people could use on, on a smaller scale if you're growing um, uh, produce for roadside stands or something other like that. And here's the 45 degree angled fence. Uh, it's the same principle here. The deer could easily jump this fence but because of their lack of depth perception, they cannot, they, they, it seems a mile across to them and, and they can't jump that type of fence. I've seen this type of fence here at a strawberry farm in Apex, North Carolina and Wake County. And the guy told me that the fence works great. Um, he's right off of Highway 55. The deer will walk right up to the highway, walk along the ditch and go in the same place that the public goes in to buy their strawberries to get into the strawberry farm. And so uh, the fence does work, but you have to completely enclose the area. Uh, otherwise they're gonna come on in there. Here's some other things, some potential tools in the toolbox. And this is some stuff that I tell people in, in um, urban areas that are having problems with deer, eating plants, that you can protect certain areas, you know, around your house or something other uh, with these repellents. Um, they, work, they work on the odor or they work on the taste. Um, I have recommended for years this stuff up here at the top called Plot Saver. They sell it at Bass Pro Shops, Cabela's. You can find it online if you just Google it. Basically what this is, is it is mineral oil and it is mixed with putrefied egg whites. 
And so there is a very similar product, and I, I can't tell you the name of it, but Lowe's and Home Depot sells it. And it's, it's basically the same make, makeup. It's a mineral oil with uh, like putrefied egg whites in it. And you could, you could probably find your own recipe online to, to make this stuff. Um, so the plot saver works with, on the bottom here, there's a little piece of nylon fencing that you put around stuff and you spray this, this uh, odor stuff on that little nylon fencing. And depending upon how much it rains, this will last somewhere between 15 and 30 days and then you have to reapply it again. Uh, you can also just simply put uh, netting, lightweight netting that you can buy at PetSmart, some Petco, somewhere like that, over the top of a plant that you don't want deer to eat, um, directly over a plant if you're trying to protect one plant. But these repellents are the, are the common thing that I recommend for folks that live in urban, suburban areas where they're having deer come in and eat their plants in the yard. You can, they, they do a pretty good job with that. Some other things, frightening, um, that's on the upper right hand side there, that's a propane cannon. Um, it, it just makes a really loud noise that, that would work, you know, if you were in some sort of a, you know, if you were growing pecan trees or fruit trees or something other like that. Um, you can use uh, pyrotechnics down here in the bottom. That, that is a pyrotechnic gun that shoots uh, screamers and whistlers and things like that to scare deer off. Um, you know, if you want to go down, make a run down the south of the border in South Carolina, you can buy fireworks and shoot over the top of them and scare, but scare them. But it's something that you continually have to do with, with these deer. And the last thing here uh, is this motion controlled water sprinkler system. And this will work really well if you, in a particular area, you're trying to keep deer out of a particular area. The thing is, and the thing with any of these things is, you have to constantly move them. Because if they get used to this motion controlled sprinkler head spraying them at one particular point, guess what? They just avoid that spot. So if this works for you a couple nights and you, you need to go outside and unstake it and move it from, and do it at a different direction. So you constantly have to keep moving it around because the deer get used to this stuff. If nothing happens to them, then they just go on about their business. I've had people say, well, could I put a coyote cardboard cutout in my yard? Or can I make coyote calls? But yeah, that might work the first time, but the, if the deer keep coming into the yard and the coyote never moves or never comes at them, then it's not gonna work for very long. So any of these things that you try, you have to constantly always uh, keep moving them, moving them around and um, not get the deer used to them basically. And in population reduction, this is probably the best option for people who have large farms um, and, and even some situations in, in urban areas as well, um, deer season, deer season is going on right now. Our deer season opens um, second week in September, runs all the way to January the 1st. Most municipalities do not have an issue with um, archery hunting inside a municipality. Most of the counties all have restrictions on where you can discharge the firearm. And so a lot of the times it'll be, you can't discharge a firearm within 300 feet of an occupied dwelling. And so that kind of puts, puts you out if you're in a sort of an urban suburban situation, but it does not stop you from finding some bow hunters and having bow hunters come in there. So on your own property, you can come into a, into a uh, uh, housing development, as long as there's no restrictions from the homeowner association, you can come in there and you could bring hunters in there and and, and shoot these deer basically with archery equipment and harvest those deer. And those deer, when they're harvested, even if the hunter himself does not want to utilize this deer, um, down at Pierce's in Franklin County there, they have Hunters for the Hunger program. So these deer can go to a worthwhile place for, for you know, those less fortunate and get a protein meal from it. So several places around that the deer can be donated. And so, DMAP, that's Deer Management Assistance Program. So that would be for large uh, acreages. You have to have a thousand acres contiguous. And so in that case, um, me or Jason would issue permits, uh, extra permits basically above and beyond the permits on your tags that you buy with your license. And so you could get say, if you had a thousand acres, I might issue you 50 or 75 um, extra deer antlerous tags to control the deer population depending on what 
the landowner's objective was. Uh, CDMAP is the same program, except it's community DMAP. So Duke Forest uh, runs this program, and we're going to have a couple in District 3. We're going to have one over in Warren County this year, and another one down in Franklin County, down at Lake Royale. They're going to be running the CDMAP program uh, in those communities and have a community hunting program that's, uh, you, you're going to have it's not something the state does it's something that we're where the community will bring hunters in that they find and we give them the tags and then those hunters can take deer inside of those uh, communities um, the urban deer season is another thing in a municipality if they decide that they have too many deer um, then they can request to be put in the urban deer season and the urban deer archery season runs from late january to the middle of February. And so Wake Forest is probably the closest to y'all that participates in that. And Wake Forest has that after the after the regular hunting season. It's, it's another bonus time for you get hunters out there that still want to harvest deer. And so the North Carolina Bow Hunter Association and also uh, a group called um, Backyard Bow Pros are both organizations that have hunters that they have vetted that they have done background checks on uh, and uh, they will provide you with names, contacts to um, get in touch with bow hunters that are interested in hunting in your particular area. So if you were having problems in Granville, um, they would say, okay, we've got these hunters down here and they, they want to come and hunt. And uh, you can work with either the North Carolina Bow Hunter Association or the Backyard Bow Pro Group. And like I said, both of those have been vetted these are, these are people that you can look at their background uh, checks and stuff like that to see that they don't have felonies, misdemeanors, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so then the last thing would be a depredation permit. And I'll talk about the depredation permit here in just a second, but I, I want to talk a little bit more here about the hunting part of it. Uh, if you're a large landowner and you're sitting there watching this right now, you know, a lot of times people will lease their land out to hunters and the problem that I see is, is that a lot of hunters now are only interested in killing a big buck, quality deer management. That's all the rage right now. They don't want to harvest the doe, they want to harvest the big buck. But what I tell people is if I own the land, I would say you want to hunt my property, you're going to kill some does on my property first before you can harvest that buck. And so Doe harvest, doe harvest, doe harvest, I say here, because those are the drivers of the population. And also, early harvest. Don't wait till the end of the season, because what we see is the people hunting right now, and they're like, I'm not going to shoot a doe right now. I'm, I'm just going to wait till after the rut's over with. I'm going to wait till the last part of November, the 1st of December. And so what we see happen then is, is that after you've hunted these deer for you know, two, three months, the deer are just scared and you can't find, you can't find these does. Well, they're readily available for harvest right now. And so if you, if you're going to, if you're going to get people to come in there and try to control and help you with your uh, deer issues, tell them to, to harvest their deer early on. Don't wait and, and make them harvest those does before they harvest a buck. If you want to do population control on your property to drive the numbers down, um, if you're having damage issues. So here's a depredation permit. Uh, these depredation permits are free. We can put multiple people on the permit. So even though if you're the farmer, if you're John Smith farmer and you don't have time to do this, you can get any group of guys together that, you know, they're not, uh, you know, that are, let's say, law-abiding citizens, we'll say, uh, that, uh, that they don't have to have any kind of license or anything like that. This, this is not hunting. This is, this is taking care of a problem. Um, so it's not hunting. So uh, if you're, if you're the, the farmer and you want these deer gone off your property, we can put multiple people on a, on a single permit. You know, you can put 10, 15 people on there. Usually we write these permits and they're good for 30 to 45 days at a time. And so, if that doesn't cure your problem after 30 or 45 days and you just get back in touch with us and we just renew you another permit, renew your permit. And so these are basically available from January the 2nd to August 1st, uh, which is outside of the hunting season uh, rules. 
uh, seasons, but we don't really issue the last 30 days before hunting season because what we found is that some people just want to go out there and shoot a buck that's got velvet on its antlers. And so uh, when the hunting season comes in, then you've got an opportunity there that you can, you can take care of that. Uh, it has a reporting requirement. You have to tell us approximately how many deer were killed and what dates they were killed. You can utilize the animal. So once again, if somebody wanted to harvest deer in March, we'll say, and the hunter didn't want the deer, you can, you can, uh, you know, you can give them to whoever, you know, if there's some Hispanics that want them or if there's a needy family that want them, you can, you can give those animals to those folks as long as you got a copy of this permit in your possession. Um, and so with big game only biologists myself or a wildlife law enforcement officer can issue that. Um, and so your local wildlife officer or myself or Jason could issue this permit usually requires that we make a site visit to confirm that you're having uh, damage to your property. And then after that, then it's just, it's just an email. We just email you the permit and then we can renew the permit for you. When is the depredation permit needed? When wildlife is causing damage to property uh, and are a realistic threat to life or property and uh, trapping season or hunting season for the offending animal is closed. When is it not needed? During an open and hunting, uh, open hunting and trapping season, we don't issue depredation permits this time of the year because you can go out there and hunt deer right now. It's currently open. General statute allows a landowner to shoot an animal in the act of doing damage. Okay, so if a deer is standing out in your field and is eating your soybeans, actively eating your soybeans, you have the right to shoot that animal without having a depredation permit. The deal is with that is you. Have, you you cannot do anything with the animal other than basically drag it to the edge of the field. Um, and so, and that, that, that's for any animal. Um, you can do that. You can, you can shoot an animal in the act of doing damage to your property, but you can't do anything with the animal other than sort of drag it out of your way. I will make the point too, that there used to, there, there was a time when we had people that just shot deer in the gut and let them run out out of the field and stuff like that, that's illegal to maliciously wound an animal like that. Um, so uh, please don't do that. And the last thing I'll talk about here uh, is feral swine, um, which increasingly are becoming an issue across the state. Um, you know, more when you get over towards Caswell over that area, obviously there's been feral swine over there for a long time. Um, but these, these animals cause a lot of damage to native wildlife and their habitats. It costs one and a half billion dollars in damage to ag crops, landscape, and, and historic sites nationwide. They, they, they carry some pretty nasty diseases. Um, I would never handle a wild pig without um, having used gloves and stuff like that because there's some really nasty diseases that these animals can carry. And we have a North Carolina feral swine task force is working to eliminate free ranging feral swine across North Carolina to protect our agricultural, cultural, and natural resources. And I will say that Jason Allen, the district five biologist, uh, is on, is our representative on that feral swine task force. So estimated harvest in 2019 for feral swine was 20,000. If you go back, um, well, back to 2015, it was 17,000, and if you, you go back in time, basically, there was, it was less and less. Um, so we are continuing to see more and more of these animals across the landscape. Um, one of the issues is that uh, we have hunters that, because you, can, because you can hunt feral swine year round, you have people that want to move feral swine around, and then they want to charge and have hunts. And, and so there's a monetary reason why people want to spread these animals around. We got the law changed some years ago that if you're moving a swine anywhere in North Carolina, it better have a tag on its ear from NCDA, from North, North Carolina Department of Agriculture, um, because we had lots of people that were trapping pigs and taking them somewhere else and releasing them because they wanted to establish a population that they could hunt that they could hunt during the summer, during the spring. And then, and, and you know, there's several places around the state now that advertise that hey, you can come and hunt, hunt pigs um, and hunt and, and pay, you know, $250, $300 a night to do this. 
Um, so this one of the problems that we've had is, is, is that hunters like these animals. They like to see them, uh, but they're not good for, they're not good for farmers. They're not good for uh, anything else, basically, other than just the hunters. But we have confirmed reports in 78 of, of 100 counties in North Carolina, and pretty much all the counties around here have all had these pigs uh, at one point in time or another. We try to get on top of it as soon as we we find out that they're in an area. Uh, I go and tell the guys that are hunting in those areas, please kill all these animals because they do nothing but cause massive destruction and they're almost impossible to eradicate. So you got to get when you first see them, you got to get rid of them because if they if they establish themselves, you're not going to get rid of them. And the USDA Wildlife Services has an active program to eradicate. They spend they they spend quite a bit of money in North Carolina uh, to try to eradicate these animals. They've been flying uh, helicopter flights and stuff like that to try to kill some up in Caswell, I know. Uh, and, and so they have then still are working pretty extensively to try to get rid of these animals in North Carolina. And so please help us uh, document feral swine in North Carolina by completing a survey um, online. The survey is available down here at the bottom, but ncwildlife.org uh, learning species, mammals, feral swine. Um, it's pretty easy to find. If you just Google uh, NC wildlife feral swine, you'll come straight to the page and you'll be able to enter that survey and, and log the location where you saw these animals at. Uh, you can also just uh, send us an email at hwi at ncwildlife.org. But uh, please, if you see some of these animals, please let us know about those animals uh, because we, we really don't want them in this area at all. Um, I'm originally from Tennessee and I worked in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And these feral swine have been hunted by the National Park Service. Most people don't know this, but they've been hunted by the National Park Service for probably 30 years. And they have never been able to get rid of every pig that is in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And they, as probably a lot of you know, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park is a really unique place. And there's some really unique plants and things in there. And these animals would just destroy, you know, whole patches of ginseng and, and other kind of uh, threatened endangered plants and so uh, you, you really don't want these animals around so with that I think that's all I have um, Jason Allen is your district five biologist for Granville and cover Person County Durham County uh, there's his number there 336-514-0306 and then I cover Franklin Vance and anything south and east of that area uh, and my number is 919 Two six nine nine seven three one, and you know we're here to help you. If you've got issues, give us a call and let us know what's going on, and we'll do the best that we can to help you out. And that's that. That's all I got, Donnie. Let me unmute here so you can hear me. Um, <clears throat> appreciate that, Greg. Uh, very good job. We do have a few questions in the chat. Um, if you don't mind. Sure. We, um, <clears throat> First one is, is the deer disease EHD a problem for sheep and goats? Uh, I think, I think, uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, you, you know, it's, it, with the chronic wasting disease, which we, we commonly get um, people mixed up with EHD, uh, with CWD, it is an issue with, with goats and sheep. They call it scrapie, I think, in, in those animals, but, um, I'm not certain, to be honest with you, about the about the EHD with with sheep and goats. Okay, Let's see if we can find out. Um, is the deer density map based off hunter harvest records? It is. It is based off of a couple of different things. Hunter harvest is one of them. The other one is uh, observational data from hunters that send us. That information we, we send out uh, basically like a log book basically and the hunters will send us observational data so we pull a lot of different resources for that and then it's run through a model but it, it figures on antler bucks per square mile uh, it, it figures on uh, doe densities and things like that it's a very complicated model but that is one aspect of the model uh, to come up with that density thank you um, with with fencing, 
Um, you mentioned the the depth perception that they have issues with. Um, Paul Westfall, who had to had to leave us this afternoon, but he um, he asked if wouldn't most deer just crawl under the fence if they if they could rather than if they saw it they couldn't jump it can they just crawl under it? Well, I mean, I, I guess that's possible. But if you notice on most of those fences, those fences are pretty low to the ground. They're like 20 inches or lower uh, under the ground. And certainly that's not something a buck's going to do. Um, it's been my experience that deer, they'll go through things and over things, but they don't go, they don't tend to go under things. I think, I think that has to do with their predatory response that if they're low down like that and they, and they can't, you know, if you're down on your belly crawling, you're kind of defenseless. And so I, you, you don't see deer do that kind of stuff, not on a, not on a normal basis, but you know, anything's possible. You know, a deer could learn how to do that and then crawl under the fence and then the rest of them follow suit. But it generally you only see them going through or over and not going and ducking under like that. And those fences are designed to be kind of low to the ground to start with. Okay. Um, can you mention, uh, talk a little bit about trap crop strategies. Uh, some farmers, some growers use trap crops in, in certain areas to uh, for crops that the deer like or prefer over a crop that they're trying to grow? Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot of experience with that. I mean, we, we get people that, you know, I get people that, that say that with like, they, they want to plant a food plot away from a house or something other like that. The problem is, is if, depending on the deer density, if you do not have uh, enough of that trap crop out there, to take care of their needs, then their next move is going to be to go right over to whatever you're trying to keep them away from. And one of the issues is if you plant something that the deer really like, and I will just take, for instance, soybeans, as y'all probably well know, um, you know, as soon as the soybeans come up, they're nipping on, they're nipping on the soybeans, they're stunting the growth of the plant. And so if that's your trap crop, yeah, you, you know, it, it hardly gets out of it hardly gets out of the ground before they've already nipped it off and killed it. So, if I was going to do a trap crop, what I would do would be to try to protect the trap crop until it got up large enough um, to where it could sustain itself, and then I'd let them have at it. Um, because I'm I'm afraid that if you if you put a trap crop out there, that they're just going to, you know, it's something they really want. They're just going to they're going to eat to the ground right when it comes out of the ground, and once they do that, they're just going to move on to the next thing. Um, this is a comment. Uh, there's a lot of towns and cities that are enrolled in the urban archery season that runs January through February. Mm -hmm. um, just comment on that. Um, for new fencing installation, what criteria do you use to determine whether you want a slant style or dual fencing type? Is there anything to... Yeah, you know, I'll be honest with you, from my standpoint, it'd be what I could afford. Um, if I can, you know, for me, the very best thing would be the 45 degree slant fence on there. But obviously that's going to cost a lot, lot more money than a double, than a double strand fence would be. And so I would get the very best thing that I could afford. But in my opinion, the 45 degree slant fence is probably the best fence. And then, you know, you can, you can make some sort of combinations of a double fence uh, using electric electric wires and make a 45 degree slant with electric wires on the very cheapest end of things. And so some of it is, is going to be trial and error, but I, I would put in the best thing that I could afford. All right. Um, I had another question as, as far as, and I, I'm not sure she asked about the programs um, and I don't know if it's the management programs or any other programs that would offer tanned hides to purchase. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we don't, we don't do anything like that here in North Carolina. Um, you know, if you go to Northern states, a lot of states will actually, they will, they will take the hides and uh, those hides will be repurposed and stuff like that. Uh, but we don't, and generally you don't find it at all in the Southeastern states because the quality of the hide in the state, because the animal uh, just doesn't experience cold enough temperatures. It, it's not really, other than a decorative item, um, it, it's just not, it's not worth it for tanneries and stuff to, to take the highs in, in this state or any southeastern state. They're just not of good enough quality. But we don't have any programs to do anything like that. Okay. Um, 
then is the landowner required to allow hunters on the land during hunting season, uh, during hunting, hunting season before getting a depredation permit? They are not. You can get you can get a depredation permit from us at any time if you're having depred you know predation problems on your crops. Um, I I just say that that if you've got depredation problems, then you probably should look at if you got people hunting on your property, you really need to turn around and look and say, well, these guys are not killing enough deer on my property. If I'm still having predation problems in the summertime, um, that's my point. There is that you need to get on those guys. Uh, but we will issue a depredation permit to anybody who is having crop damage currently. All right. Um, and then uh, Paul McKenzie put on, um, if any hunters want to help with the observation survey, you can get the details and he, he put the link there for the details of, of that, um, that survey. So uh, if you want any information about that. Are there any other questions for Greg this afternoon? Um, if you want to put it in the chat or either just unmute and, and ask, it would be fine. Any, um, any other comments or, or questions for, for him? I'll, I'll just comment on, uh, you, you, you spoke about the, the plants as far as deer resistant plants and as a horticulture agent, we get a lot of questions about those. Um, and, and I've pretty much come to the point of, there is no deer proof, as you said, plants. They will try, yeah. especially Bambi, you know, the young ones, they'll, they'll browse and try anything once. Mm -hmm. um, it is very difficult to, to find plants that they, they will not at least do a little bit of damage on uh, in the landscape. Those, you know, I've seen, I've seen in an area in Tennessee, um, it was an old uh, munitions plant and it was covered in Chinese privet. Well, typically deer don't like Chinese privet, but because these deer were so it was such a dense population, they mowed the Chinese privet right down. Um, you know, so like I said, if their numbers get high enough, they get hungry enough, they'll eat anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Paul McKenzie uh, did also put in the, this is another program that we have next week, it's a woodland management uh, program. Paul, do you wanna mention anything about that as well? Awesome, <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, um, sure, here's the, Here's the page that that link link takes you to, and that's next Friday. We're, that session will happen at 2 p.m. Our presenter will be Dr. Robert Barden of NC State Extension Forestry, and he'll kind of give us, I think, a broad overview of uh, different forest management practices that can benefit uh, not only timber production, but uh, I think one thing we've learned in this series is that uh, a lot of the things that help timber production can also be beneficial to wildlife as well for those that have that, that interest. So it should be an interesting program. Um, Dr. Barden does a great job. Again, next Friday at two, there is a separate registration for that. Um, we'll try to send an email reminder out to everyone on this list if we can do that. Um, but uh, again, you do need to register separately for next Friday's program. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate that, Paul. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good program that um, we've been doing with the NC Forest Service. Uh, it's, uh, it's great. So um, also we have a, uh, an ant, a fire ant, in the Red Imported Fire Ant program next Thursday night at seven. Uh, just wanted to, to mention that if anybody is uh, having any issues with uh, Red Imported Fire Ants, uh, either uh, ongoing or for the first time uh, they're moving into Person County and a lot of uh, Person County homeowners and, and farmers are having to, to deal with them. And there we go with that uh, information. So you can um, visit that, that website and, uh, and register for, for that next week. Um, uh, Dr. Watson's going to be talking to us. He's a, he's a, a livestock entomologist, but he's going to speak to us about controlling them in pastures as well as, as in the landscape area. So, uh, and hay fields uh, as well. So they've uh, uh, seem like they have really made an influx here in the uh, late summer, early fall um, in many areas. So if you're interested in that, that program, we uh, have that. And that's next, next Thursday, um, October 15th at 
7 p.m. So that's an evening evening program there. Any other questions for for Greg? Oh, this is Randy Everhart in Davidson County. Uh, you mentioned the uh, feral hogs. Uh, so far on our farm, we've not noticed uh, any evidence. What evidence would be we be looking for for hogs coming in? Yeah, so it'll be very obvious. Uh, hogs will root the ground up, so they'll 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 use their snout and they dig like a trench. And so they literally, you'll hear people say they roto root or the ground. And so that's the kind of damage that you would see caused from hogs. Uh, you'll also note that they're around from having wallows in places where you got wet areas. And then they will rub, rub the mud off on trees and you'll see trees that have mud all up and down the side of them. And so, but the, the first thing you're gonna notice is gonna be that roto rootering of the ground. Um, where they're destroying the, 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 the literally the ground and the vegetation. Right. Any other comments or questions for, for Greg? Great information, Greg. Uh, really do appreciate you doing this uh, presentation. This is, this is really good. Um, any other questions? One fifty-eight. So we got a, still got a couple of minutes here, and uh, all right. Well, not seeing any. Um, and Kim, some people have mentioned about the um, uh, the recording, and Kim has put in here the recording will be posted. Uh, I think Kim, you have a, a a Google Drive set up for that that we've been putting those in. Is that correct? Yes, so um, we're trying to get these recordings all in um, a single location on the on a Google Drive folder. Um, we just have to close caption the videos before we can make them public or whatnot. So we're working on trying to get that done. Um, and as soon as they're available, you know, closed captioned and, and meet all the requirements that we have to follow, we'll let everybody know uh, how you can access that. But it, we'll send out a, a link to a Google Drive folder that you should be able to access. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? And uh, Paul McKenzie's put in the, uh, the links to all the fire ant and the uh, woodland management programs, um, as well as the, the survey, wildlife survey. So please capture those if you'd like. Um, yeah, Greg, I'm, I'm one of, I, I've participated in the hunter observation studies mm -hmm. a, few, a few times and it, it's pretty fun. It gives you a nice record of your hunts and, um, also, uh, of course the reports are posted online, but, um, the participants get a hard copy in the mail which is pretty neat to go through and, and, and read all that. And, and then you also get a cool little sticker to put on your truck, which is really the best part. So. Right. Right. Well, you know, we found that we think it's our opinion that those hunter observation studies are, are more accurate data than our actual hunting harvest information. The reason why is, is because you got a lot of people who don't report their harvest. And so, uh, you know, we, we, ha we figure in, we figure in an additional 20% uh, of deer um, that we figure go unreported. So it seems that the observational data set is a better data set than our actual harvest data is. Nice. Right. Well, Greg, I don't see any more any more questions? But uh, very, very good. Um, Na Natasha was asking about event about other events being posted on Eventbrite, and we are trying to get our events on Eventbrite now. So um, if you keep an eye on that, uh, you should see our our program. So all right. Well, it is two oh one. So um, again, Greg, thank you very much. Uh, great job and. Yeah, great job, Greg. Excellent information. Yeah, yeah. Glad to help everybody.
look forward to other programs and um, we will, no other comments or questions, we will end the meeting, all right? Thank everybody for attending. Does any other agents have anything to add? Anything they need to say, all right. Sounds good. Everybody have a great weekend.